Yeah, let's uh, <laughs> let's start off by playing Where's Waldo. As you know, both of us are from California, and it's the summer, so it's wildfire season. So I found a satellite image of California here, and Sharon, can you spot the wildfire in this image? Ah, uh, yes. Let's see. So I do see something that looks like a cloud that could very well be an ash plume, and it's like south of San Francisco, where I know there were wildfires. So um, is that the little thing at the bottom? Is that the wildfire? Yeah, that is the wildfire. You're good. Um, let's up the ante a little bit. And now I have an image of multiple states in the US. Can you spot the wildfire now? Hmm. Um, this is a little harder because I have no idea about this terrain. And these might as well be clouds. So I'm just going to take a random guess. Is that middle thing over there, is that a wildfire? That is a wildfire. But there are also four other wildfires in this image. Isn't that hard? Since that was so hard, imagine someone trying to do that for 197 square miles of the Earth. Yeah, and um, not just like for one day. Like climate scientists have to do it for 365 days a year. And NASA has over 20 years worth of data that they had to do this for. And if you thought finding wildfires were tough, uh, there are so many interesting things happening on our little blue planet that we call Earth. For sure. Climate scientists study a variety of phenomena, like hurricanes, sand dune shapes, oil spills, and even polar vortexes. And then there is this mountain of data that scientists have to deal with. In 2050 alone, NASA had about 150 Earth observation satellites, and they were producing just about two petabytes of uh, data per year. And by 2020, they launched five times as many satellites, and the amount of data produced was about 14 petabytes a year. In just about five years, that's seven times the amount of data growth. And if that wasn't bad enough, there are uh, this problem is just going to get worse. There are some uh, launches, uh, high volume data missions that are planned that are supposed to launch in the year 2025 that is expected to put the data size to about 50 petabytes per year. Thanks, Obama, <laughs> I guess. Um, imagine being a scientist. Uh, who, sp who spent multiple years getting their master's degree, then PhD, then postdoc, only to spend their time and weeks and months at that looking for and cataloging the right data set, taking them away from the skills that they acquired in this degree. But it doesn't have to be such a manual process. Machine learning and AI are, have been here for a while, and they're here to help with this problem. That's true. Um, similarity search at scale is not really a new problem. Um, it's it, it is solved. If you I mean, we see that every day on Pinterest, like they have a similar image option, Google reverse image search and um, any AI practitioner worth their salt will tell you that there are models available that you can use out of the box to solve similarity search for you. But this data is very different. The satellite data that we're talking about, unlike most of the images on the web that have helpful hashtags, this satellite data is completely unlabeled. And it's not easy to label this data either. Here I have two satellite images that I picked up, one of a coastal fog and one of a fire. Sharon, can you tell the difference between them? I mean, to me, they look exactly alike. Yeah, me neither. Turns out you need years of study to differentiate between them. And you can't just send it to a mechanical Turk to get it labeled. Yeah, I mean, and we can't really crowdsource the labeling either. Um, most of us here have had to prove one time or another that we were not a robot by identifying pictures of boats and bicycles and whatnot. But the problem with this, the NASA images, is that you need a special skill set to be able to identify that. So we can't really use something like captures for labeling, for the labeling effort. Yeah, if we did, except for a few Earth scientists, everyone else will fail the test. The other thing about this data that makes it unique is that um, it's not balanced either. 
And what do we mean by unbalanced? As you probably know, the, wor the world is made up of almost 70% water bodies on the surface, and this is reflected in our data set. The rest of it is interesting terrain like mountains, deserts, etc. But the truly interesting features that we want to study, like forest fires, hurricanes, they amount for less than 0.1%. And this imbalance is really bad from a training perspective. A model trained with such imbalance data will become amazingly proficient at detecting water bodies and terrain, but it will not be great at all and won't give us any degree of accuracy with hurricanes or forest fires. That's true. Um, traditionally, Im uh, data imbalance such as this um, was fixed through strategies like undersampling and oversampling from data classes. Um, for example, one simple strategy one could use is to just pick a fixed number of data units from each class, irrespective of the actual distribution. But the problem is to even group this into data classes uh, or to like identify it into like a group of water bodies or deserts or mountains, we need a way to identify these images as such. And the problem is our data is unlabeled, so we don't really have a way to do that. I guess there are a lot of challenges doing reverse image search on this satellite data. Has anyone solved them yet? Have you heard of this little organization called NASA? Hmm. <laughs> I think I have heard of them. <laughs> so NASA has a program called FDL, which stands for Frontier Development Lab. Uh, which is an AI accelerator uh, for NASA. They work on cool projects such as night vision for the moon, study of cause of cancer in astronauts. They have even solved the problem of auto detection of weather phenomena, but only in theory. NASA uses something called the technology readiness level to help categorize the stages of their projects. These projects range from one to nine, where one is the initial idea of a project, which goes through several incremental iterations, like proof of concept, experiment, etc., and all the way till TRL nine, which means that a project is mission ready and battle tested. Most of the projects at NASA's AI Accelerator are at TRL three. Um, that is at an early proof of concept. Uh, the end result is usually a research paper after experimentation in the lab. Um, this climate science project, which helps us detect all these weather phenomena, was no exception. It, was at, it ended up at this research stage and did not make it beyond that. Wouldn't it be nice if we could take this project and do the reverse image search and take it all the way to as close to TRL9 as possible? Yes, uh, that's a great idea. And um, that's exactly how a team of volunteer AI experts and industry professionals like you and I came together to turn this idea into a product. And SpaceML was formed. Can you remind me what SpaceML is again? SpaceML is a part of NASA FDL. And uh, it's uh, and SpaceML's goal is to build a toolbox and a developer community for applying AI to space science and exploration. You can think of it as an AI training lab. The goal is for is to bring in people with specific skill sets who can take an idea and build a proof of concept within a three to four week time span, and then take it to production within a three to six month time span. So. If you're wondering how SpaceML really works, we are here to tell you. The program is based on a mentorship model. There are mentors or consultants whose goal is to put together a strategy, a design, and a roadmap. And they usually guide a team of students and volunteers to build a product. These student volunteers who get involved often do it to get some, a real life project on the resume, or maybe they do it to get more experience in machine learning and AI. The most important thing to note is that SpaceML has a revolving door of participants. Many times they spend, they can spend any time from three months to a whole year on a project before moving on. Now let's go back to the problem at hand. Um, before we go deeper, let's take a few minutes to take a refresher on 
like how similarity search is actually achieved. Since we are not AI experts, let's go over like the basics of similarity search. First, you take a set of all your training images and convert them into a set of embeddings. What is an embedding, uh, you might wonder. An embedding is essentially a vector representation of all the important features of the image. It maps an image to any kind, uh, to a, another low dimensional space. And, and when you plot all of the generated images from your training data in this lower dimensional space, then hopefully a natural pattern emerges if you've chosen your features correctly. And the similar images are closer together in space and form clusters. If we zoom in a little bit here, you can see a bunch of faces down at the bottom. And then slightly to the top and left, you can see a bunch of boats. So when there is an input image for which you want to find other similar images, you would take the model that you used to generate embeddings for your test data set and apply it to the test image that will generate an embedding for it. Then this embedding is mapped to the vector space of rest of your input data. And the effect is um, that similar, uh, based on the embeddings, we can find the distance between each of the other embeddings in the vector space. This provides a kind of a natural order or a natural classification where similar images are kind of lumped together and closer together. And uh, ones that are very different from each other are further apart in this vector space. Um, and this is what allows us to find nearest, uh, perform nearest neighbor search or similarity search on unlabeled data. But the problem is uh, to perform nearest neighbor search we have to compare the distance between each image with every other image in the space. Doing this in brute force, uh, in a brute force way, is really, really slow. Um, I wonder if we can speed it up. Yeah, there is a way to speed it up. That's known as approximate nearest neighbor search. If you heard Lester Solbakens talk about approximate nearest neighbor search on Tuesday, right here at Berlin Buzzwords, that's what we're talking about here. We use approximate nearest neighbor libraries like FAISS from Facebook, Annoy from Spotify, or Scan from Google. These end up trading accuracy for speed, giving us a much faster response than brute force. While we do lose some accuracy here, we do get a pretty high re recall rate, which is a good trade-off to make for speed. As you know, the world is full of compromises. The one thing is, if we only used this similarity-based clustering for image search, given our data is unlabeled, our accuracy was not so great. And so we really wanted to improve this because it was quite noisy. So how do we improve this accuracy? We can use a combination of clustering along with labeling only the most confusing images to improve our accuracy. For this, we do need to add a human in the loop for a small portion of the search results. The user, typically an expert, will annotate only the most tricky images for us by telling us if it is a wildfire or if it's not a wildfire. And we can use this information to retrain our model and continue improving our accuracy with every use. And now that we have had this quick refresher and know at a very high level how it works, the next thing we would have to do is actually find out what our data looks like. Yes, and um, not to mention how much this is going to cost us. Um, so what we ended up doing, we did a little back of the envelope calculation to figure out like how uh, what the data would look like. Um, so NASA satellites click images of the Earth at different resolutions, ranging from 250 meter per pixel to 30 meter per pixel. There are some newer missions planned that have the capability to improve the resolution to even 15 meter per pixel. The data size for the lower end of the spectrum, the 250 meter per pixel, is about 12 gigs per day. And for the higher 15 meter per pixel resolution, the uh, size is closer to 500 gigs per day. This may not seem too large for large companies like, let's say, Netflix or Lyft. Uh, that process like much higher data volumes on a daily basis. But this, uh, what I forgot to tell you before, is that this is just for one image format. NASA satellites actually collect images in many different formats. And by different formats, I mean like uh, 
frequency uh, bands in uh, on the frequency spectrum like infrared and RGB. When we add all this up, this puts the total data size for just one day at 500 terabytes. So do we actually need all the 500 terabytes of data? Yeah, uh, so it looks like we really do. Let's, let's look at these two images on the screen. Um, the one on the right was taken by NASA's HLS satellites at a 30 meter per pixel resolution. You, you will see, you will notice that this has more clarity. You can see smaller details like transitions between terrains and like transition between the water body and so on. And um, th this like higher details are good for finding, detecting things like beaches where, where there are transitions or small islands or even like smaller objects like sand dunes. Yeah, that makes sense. And the one on the left, as you can see, is much lower resolution. For detecting phenomena that span hundreds of kilometers, for example, like a hurricane, this lower resolution should be sufficient. And if we use this for detection, the, detecting these large phenomena, we can probably save a bunch of space and time since these images are much smaller. Yeah, and it doesn't really end there. Um, uh, there are also different image formats. Other, like We talked about resolution, but different formats or bands also serve uh, different purposes. For example, this is these two images belong to the same portion of the Earth, but taken in two different bands. The one on the right is taken with the red visible spectrum, and uh, it is useful for identifying clouds and cloud patterns. The one on the left was taken with an infrared in, in the infrared band. The temperature variations exposed by infrared are useful for estimating heights of clouds. Okay, so it looks like we do need the different resolutions as well as the different products. Yeah. So we look, we need most of this data. So give it to me straight, Sharon. How much is this going to cost us? So let's continue our back of the envelope calculations. Um, to index and serve one day's worth of data at 250 meters per pixel resolution. And we used a conservative throughput estimate of 128 images per second with commodity hardware. This will cost us about $8. That's not too bad. That's like two Starbucks. Easy peasy. But to serve, uh, to index and serve 30 meter resolution images for one day will cost us about $76. That's not too bad either. But to process 20 years worth of data will cost us a whopping $100,000 each time. And the funny thing is, this is not even a one time cost. Backfills in our system are more common than we initially thought. Yeah. I guess every time a model changes, we might need to reprocess all of this data. But even 100,000 doesn't seem too bad, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe not for the companies that you and I work for, but try asking the United States federal government for funding and you will, you will know. Okay, so now that we know about the data and we have an estimate for the cost, we, need, we found it crucial to nail down our design goals up front. First and foremost, we want our system to be completely cloud agnostic. This complexity comes from the fact that FDL has a close relationship with Google Cloud Platform, and they are the ones who are providing us with free credits to build a proof of concept. Once we build this system in production, we might have to hand it over to NASA's AIT, and their system runs on AWS. Since we knew this going in, we try to design our systems in such a way that if and when we do have to make a migration, it's quite easy to do so. Apart from this, we also wanted to make sure that each component could be developed independently and were loosely coupled. With such a fragmented team working at different hours, this was more important than usual. We, we could not deal with the communication overload. With this in mind, right off the bat, right from the beginning, we relied heavily on a microservices based architecture and uh, abstractions, even during initial proof of concept. The interface between components is usually an API so that each can continue to evolve uh, separately. The other thing we focused on building was that we wanted to build an end-to-end -end system on a very small data set to test it thoroughly and make sure our pipeline works and only then make it scalable to larger data sets. 
we also made sure to benchmark any open source libraries and components and external components that we used so that we were picking the right one as our architecture evolved and as our data scaled up. And we have been doing this continuously. The one good thing about uh, em uh, employing abstractions in our architecture is that whenever, as we are doing these benchmarks, whenever we find better tools or better libraries, we can switch it out very quickly without really affecting the rest of the system. And last but not least, since the folks who are going to be using these tools may or may not be from a computer science background, we wanted to make sure that our final product is super easy to use. And now with these design principles all nailed down, um, let's dive into the architecture of the system that we ended up building. All of our satellite imagery that we have been talking about is available via NASA GIPS, which stands for Global Imagery Browsing Services. GIPS provides us access to almost a thousand different satellite imagery products, and they cover every part of the world. Most of this imagery is uploaded daily and is available within a few hours after satellite observation. Uh, what we needed to build was a way to bring these this data, these images from NASA's data centers and their cloud onto GCP, where, which is where we were building our pipeline. And also there was a bunch of pre-processing that needed to happen to make it usable in a machine learning pipeline. And for this, the team built a tool called the Gibbs Downloader. It's the Gibbs Downloader essentially does three main things. So one is it uh, brings it it ma makes really fast transfer of data to to our cloud, and then it provides something called as tiling. Why do we need tiling? So um, the images that NASA satellites collect, it's basically one big flattened image of the Earth, like like what we see on the screen. To identify phenomena, we need to break it up into multiple images. So Gibbs Downloader allows us to generate these tiles at different resolutions and also different overlaps. Why do we need overlaps between tiles? Let's look at this image. Um, if we did not have overlaps, this is one big image of a wildfire. If we did not have overlaps, uh, it could be broken up into multiple tiles and uh, which kind of like fragments the image and makes it difficult for our model to identify this as a wildfire. So uh, the Gibbs downloader also has the configuration option to choose overlap so that we can um, so that we can have like we can have complete pictures like this going into our system. Now that we have built something to get us the right input images, we can train a self-supervised learning model we spoke about earlier to iterate on these images and optimize itself for satellite imagery. But if you recall, we mentioned earlier that the Earth images are quite sparse and interesting features. So we needed to build a data balancer using a diversity algorithm to help our model be more balanced. But didn't we say in the beginning that we can't really sample data because we don't have um, labels? So can you remind me how did we end up solving this? Yeah, that's right. Our data is unlabeled. So we had to find a novel way to sample these images. And this is where our embeddings come to the rescue. As we discussed previously, the embeddings map our data to a lower dimensional vector space. The net, the net result of this is that similar images appear closer together. On the screen, we have some labels here, but just for reference. Right. So what happens is because similar images are closer together and these clusters are further apart from dissimilar images, it allows us to group them together. And even though we have no idea which cluster is which, we do know their distribution. And that's all we need to perform their sampling and force a diversity in our data set. So what the data balancer library will do is first it picks a random image and ensure that the next images it picks is from a cluster that is the furthest away from the current cluster as possible. And it repeats this process until we have a catalog of super diverse images. This awesome diversity picker library was also built and open sourced by our team and is available on GitHub. So now that we have the models specifically trained for our Gibbs images, we can use that along with the Gibbs downloader to index and create embeddings for as many day, days of data as we want or we want to retain. 
can you tell me what goes on behind the scenes in the indexer pipeline? Yes. So the indexer pipeline is at the core, is at the heart of the search engine. It processes raw data obtained from NASA and prepares it for model training as well as feature extraction. The data generated, the final output of the indexer pipeline is what powers the search API to serve reverse search image results. The indexer pipeline takes as input a uh, date, tile resolution, as well as image format. We run separate instances of, uh, of each pipeline for each resolution and for image format. And the reason is because we have trained these models to uh, specifically for uh, the custom resolution and, uh, and, image, uh, and uh, image format. We, once uh, we process these images and we tile them, we store these tiles to the blob store. Uh, our pipeline hasn't ended then. This is a second stage in the pipeline. The reason for st uh, storing these uh, tiles to blob store is it, it's twofold. One is for checkpointing purposes. We want to make sure that if our pipeline dies, it can just you know continue from where it left off. And the second reason is these tiles that are generated by the indexer could be used by the training team as well so that they don't have to repeat this work. These tiles in the blob store are partitioned by date, image format, and resolution. And why, the reason why we, form, uh, we store it by different resolutions because they serve different purposes. Different resolutions cover different physical regions of the Earth. Once the tiles are generated, now the next order of business is to generate embeddings. So as I mentioned, we use special, uh, separate uh, SSL models we train for that specific resolution and format. Um, our, the embedding size we use, the vector size we use is 128 bytes. This is on the smaller side, um, and we do give up some accuracy. But for our use case, we were able to get a reasonable match, even with a model trained on unlabeled data. The doing feature extraction over billions of images uh, can be a really slow process because there is serialization, deserialization that needs to happen, a lot of processing to do feature extraction from images. And the embedding generation became the bottleneck for our, for our pipeline. And uh, each data unit in our case is a few megabytes in size. So what, so what we ended up doing, we ended up using NVIDIA's DALI pipeline, along with GPU-enabled compute instances to speed this up. DALI stands for Data Loading Library. It provides an efficient way to decode and pre-process images, and as well as like audio files and so on, uh, through GPU-accelerated augmentations. And this can be used for training and inference by the model. Using DALI pipeline actually helps speed up the embedding generation by seven uh, by seven x. Wow. The embedding files are uh, containing a serialized byte stream of the embeddings are also stored in a blob store. Each embedding also contains metadata uh, such as date, resolution, lat long, and this links it back to the actual tile. Embedding files are also stored in a blob store, and they are also partitioned by date, pro, uh, format, and resolution. But the indexer's work is not done yet. Now we have to organize these embeddings, basically index them, to make approximate nearest neighbor search really fast. And we discussed that there were several libraries we uh, considered, but we ended up using uh, FACE, or F-A-I-S-S, -S from Facebook. Even though in ANN benchmarks, scan uh, performed better than face, the reason why we chose face is because one on a GPU machine, it ended up being almost as fast as scan, which was great. And uh, this has been used in production at Facebook scale. So it's already battle tested. Um, but that being said, we are still continuously benchmarking these. And if something better emerges, we can easily replace it later without impacting the pipeline. The indexed embedding files are also stored in a blob store, in our case, Google Cloud Storage, partitioned by date, resolution, and format. 
One benefit of this partitioning strategy is that um, when a user fires off a search query and when the search API has to fetch the uh, index files to serve, they don't. They can just go to the specific partitions instead of having to look through the entire data set. Now that we've talked about having the model strained and the embedding generated, we can actually perform the search. So what we did was build a search API that can easily power these use cases. Let's take a closer look at the search API. This is the piece that ties it all together. A web browser plugin or even a human can use this API to search among the generated indexes. We built this with modularity in mind and ensure that we use clear abstractions so that we don't have to re-modify this API anytime the models are updated. We built some easy to use extensible REST APIs for this reverse image search. And because we're on GCP, we ended up hosting it on App Engine. We used a fast API library along with Swagger UI behind the scenes to build this API. One thing to note is that because we needed some specialized C++ models to run these, to run these machine learning libraries, an app engine does not natively support our C++ runtime, we had to add a custom Docker integration to support all the libraries that we need today and we might need in the future. The first API that we added was for our base use case. That is to find uh, to do a reverse image search on any weather phenomenon that's currently being studied by a scientist. Let's take a look into what goes into making this happen. When we get the input image from the browser, the first thing to do is to download the image from NASA's world. We also directly support downloading from Google Cloud Storage for non world view data sets. Once we have the image, we have to download the model and generate the input embeddings for this Im image. For this, we added a thin API layer to fetch the most up-to-date models intelligently through inference based on input parameters. That is, for example, if an input image is of a particular type, say modus, we would fetch the correct model based on what the input image is about. But the user, in case they want to benchmark or test something else, can also specify the exact model they want. And since these machine learning models are pretty large and can potentially make our API slower, we also added caching to, make it to improve our performance. Next, what we have to do is fetch the related embeddings from the embedding store. Remember, each day's worth of data might have multiple embeddings based on the model that was used to generate these embeddings. And since we have multiple copies, we have to pick the right one. And since it doesn't make sense to update this kind of business logic in the search API directly, we added a, another Google function to abstract this away. This ensured that, that we pick the right embeddings without having to worry about changing our business logic, but it also gave the indexer team a chance to repartition their data anytime they saw fit without affecting us. And now that we have all of the information required, that is the partition search indexes, as well as the input embeddings, we can use the approximate nearest neighbor search library to perform the search and retrieve the top k similar images. But one thing, this is a little bit tricky because of the way the embeddings are partitioned based on dates. Given a large input date range to search, we probably have to search among multiple index files. What do I mean by this? Imagine if you're looking for hurricanes in the month of August over the last few years. The closest hurricane to the one that you're searching might be from August 2020, but the next closest one might be in August 2017. So after fetching the top key results from each index, we have to combine them and use the distance metrics that we have generated to find the true top key images. What we actually get as a result is a bunch of embeddings and with associated metadata. This in itself is not super usable directly by a user. So the last step that we have to do is data extraction and manipulation to make this into a format of an image URL that the NASA Worldview website can understand. This includes information like S3 cloud storage location, bounding box, lat long, etc. And once we put all of this together in a way that's extensible, 
we can return it to the web browser plugin so that it can be easily rendered on the screen. And because we're so cost sensitive and a small operation, we designed the search API to run on commodity hardware using just CPUs, no expensive GPU in sight. Last, we spoke about how we use this for reverse image search, right? Uh, this is for our climate scientists, friends. But also, we didn't want to forget our lovely ML engineers either. So we added a few different API that can help them programmatically improve their modeling. We added a search directly for embeddings. And remember the diversity algorithm? We also added an API to help, them, to help anyone find the most diverse images in a data set and added a bonus discovery API so that everyone can be up to date on what, what we have latest indexed. As you know, our data is unlabeled. And to improve our models, labels are great. Um, so the team also built a swipe labeler which can easily bring a human into the loop to classify images with a single swipe. We were inspired by Tinder. Um, and this leverages the search API, as well as the scientists who are using the search API to do the labeling for us. This is, this is how it works. So uh, let's say a scientist is cataloging the data using our search API, and they request hurricanes. And when they are going through the results, they can take a look and say, OK, this looks right. So uh, you know, it's a swipe right and swipe left and so on. And by doing this, they are tagging, uh, they are giving us information that this is a hurricane and this is not. And we use this binary classification to uh, retrain our models so that with each search, it becomes even, it becomes more and more accurate. And it is, it is also really fun to do, or at least that's what we have been told. Last but definitely not least, coming back to the climate scientists, to make this whole system super usable, we built a browser plugin where they can just screenshot patterns that they're looking for, and we'll return them the similar images. Let's show you how it actually looks like. Here's a screenshot of this Chrome plugin that was built. As you can see, if you just screenshot a picture of a cloud pattern that a scientist is looking for, we'll return some pretty close patterns of the clouds that they're looking for. And if you want to go on a vacation post this pandemic, look no further. You can take a screenshot of your favorite coral reef and find ones that are quite similar to that. And do you remember the Suez Canal issue that happened earlier this year? If you're interested to save someone millions in shipping and want to monitor desert water desert boundaries, then you can probably use our tool for mm -hmm. as well. Now, we really want to talk about the scrappy little team that built this from scratch. Not only did we have limited resources, but we also had tons of other organizational challenges. We had multiple small teams focused on optimizing a small component of the architecture, and uh, fo they focused on a small problem. And people who got involved uh, not just did that because they wanted to learn, but also because they, were really, they really wanted to make an impact towards climate change uh, research. We had collaborators from multiple countries, like India, Canada, USA, Mexico, Korea, Nigeria, and even right here in Germany. Given that we had so many different folks, we required constant communication and feedback in a tight loop. Some folks were also rotating in and out, and so we needed to be able to get everyone up to date ASAP. Multiple time zones were a challenge as well, and so we had to uh, have many late night and early morning meetings to synchronize. So what's next for the Space ML crew, you might wonder? We want to extend the applicability of this project to go beyond our planet, and we are looking to the rest of the outer space. And the Space ML team has already started collaborating with some space scientists to do some initial analysis and research. Here are some images. The one on the left is images from Cassini mission, and they were sorted based on similarity among features identified through SSL. And on the right, we have Voyager mission images grouped by the same feature embeddings identified in the Cassini dataset. The next thing we want to do is we want to open this up to the world. We want to um, enable anyone who wants to uh, build something like this using the tools that we built for any use case, not just limited to climate science or Earth. 
And for this, we have uh, started publishing high quality open source libraries for every component of the pipeline that we, uh, that we just showed you. We wanted to leave you with one thought. Anything is possible. The knowledge and the data is available. The tools are out there. SpaceML is proof that anyone with enough motivation can be part of something bigger. If you're interested in machine learning or artificial intelligence, you can use any number of small existing data sets to get off your training wheels, so to speak, and the sky is literally the limit. At SpaceML, we've had students, we've had folks with decades of experience, but we've also had folks from completely orthogonal backgrounds, like English, work on SpaceML and bring this amazing vision to life. And last, but definitely not the least, um, Dharani and I are here just to represent the amazing work done by a wonderful crew of folks from all around the world. From the English teacher in Mexico who wanted to become a data scientist, to the student in Nigeria who would go to the cyber cafe to work on our project because the internet at his home was unreliable. Uh, to all these folks who donated their time to make a positive impact on this world, we want to say thank you. We also want to thank all the future collaborators who will hopefully continue this work that we have started and help save our planet so that we can finally go ahead and cancel our plans to move to Mars. Here with me is Sharon Thomas. She's a software engineer who lives and works in San Francisco. She used her experience in distributed systems, big data and streaming to design the core pipeline and mentor the team who was working on productionizing it. And please meet my friend Dharmi. Uh, she also lives and works in San Francisco. She's a software engineer who has been primarily focused on large scale distributed systems at Twitter. At Space ML, she helped design the search API and mentored the team that brought it to life. With that, we would like to thank you for listening to us. Uh, we are here to answer any questions. If we are out of time, you can also find us on Twitter. Our handles are on the screen. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. Um, so everyone can send in questions now. There are none so far, but there is a lot of applause in the live stream. Um, so <laughs> our audience uh, seemed to like it very much. I liked it very much. Um, just um, one one quick question from my side. You you mentioned a lot the the diverse team that is distributed all around the world. Basically, volunteers working on this. Um, is there anything any any tips that you can give or any learnings that you have on how to collaborate in this distributed way? Um, yeah, I think uh, what we mentioned was um, the constant communication is crucial here, especially because we had so many different components and we had to constantly keep talking to each other. Uh, we used Slack, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we had different meeting rooms and things like that, but it definitely did require a lot of um, uh, a lot of late night and early morning meetings to synchronize. Yeah. And project planning, I guess, like we were so focused on project planning to make sure that each, that we are building everything in small components with very little overhead, like a, a communication overhead between teams. So these were like the two main things.